All right, very good morning. In today's lecture, we are going to talk about the composition of the intracellular fluid, but we'll also talk about extracellular fluid. We'll talk about all the different ions and other components that we find inside cells, but also outside. And building on the composition and differences and similarities, but mostly differences in composition between the intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid, we will also speak about certain phenomena which are very important for the normal functioning of cells, but also play a great role in some abnormal states in the body. Namely, we will talk about osmosis, uh, we will talk about membrane potential, okay, how, how it arises, what it is, etc. And at the end of the lecture, we will talk a little bit more about pH and mostly about buffers. So a lot of these topics are things that you already heard about previously, okay? Some more and some maybe less, okay? So I will cover a little bit, a tiny little bit of revision or, you know, just to get everybody up to speed. But we will move these topics a little bit further into more, uh, so less kind of basic chemistry stuff and more into uh, cellular biology, physiology and how things actually influence the functioning how these things influence the functioning of cells. So that's the plan for today. Now, for a lot of the lecture, we will assume that the inside of a cell is basically just an aqueous solution with all sorts of different components in it. And these components, these small molecules, can just float around and they are freely dissolved and can react. Well. This is not quite what the reality is like, okay? Here you can see a 3D model that was recently, a few years ago, that was made um, based on actual concentrations of proteins, DNA, lipids, etc., in a bacterial cell. So this is a bacterium. This is one of the smallest bacteriums that exists. Okay, it's called mycoplasma. Um, and here you can see, so we're starting from the membrane itself, and then the membrane goes away, and you see what the inside, which is called cytoplasm. So now we're looking into the cytoplasm of a bacterium. And what you can see there is that it's absolutely packed with macromolecules, with proteins, with bits of DNA, okay? The, the yellow bits are, are chromosomes, basically, DNA of the, uh, of, the, of the bacterium, okay? And all sorts of different proteins. So even though in, when we talk about pH and when we talk about membrane potential, we kind of assume that the whole cell is just a little bag of watery substance containing all these things, this is much more closer to, uh, this is much closer to what, we, what the real cells are like. So this is a prokaryotic cell. Of course, in eukaryotic cells, we have much more internal organization, okay? So obviously the DNA, uh, uh, in, in a eukary eukaryotic cell is not just floating around in the cytoplasm, it's hidden in the nucleus, etc., etc. So there are a lot of differences. And the reason why we have a model of a bacterium, of a tiny bacterium, one of the smallest bacteria, is that making a model of a eukaryotic cell would be enormously more complicated to actually do it right, okay? So that's why we don't really have that for your eukary at, at least I don't know that we have that for a eukaryotic cell. But this gives you an idea about what the what the inside of a cell, of our cells, looks like, okay? It's absolutely packed with stuff. And this also means that, and we will come to this again and again and again, that free diffusion of things, so just moving of molecules or, uh, you know, metabolites or whatever, or signaling molecules in the cell, is not an easy thing to do. So most of our cells, and you've seen it and you will see it again, most of the inside of our cells is very tightly organized so that we don't actually have to move things very far in the cell. So you don't really get that something is produced in one, si one side of the cell and has to travel all along the cell to get somewhere else because it would take forever, okay? Even for very small molecules, this could take, you know, a second, which for metabolic pathways is, is a really, really long time to wait for something to come in, okay? And for large molecules, it can take for some large cells, it can take days, okay, to actually cross the whole cell. For example, in neurons, which can be, you know, a meter long. So, 
This just, I mean, we will come to it again and again, okay? The inside of a cell is packed, it's tightly organized. Things that need to work together are very close to each other in the cell. They are not in separate parts of the cell. So this is just to give you an idea of what it's like really, because now we're gonna be talking as if the cell was really just an aqueous solution, but it's not. So a lot of the things, a lot of the concentrations, concentration changes, uh, electric potential changes, etc., actually occur in very small volumes, just close to the membrane or close to the enzymes, and they don't really change things inside of the whole cell because it would take a very long time. Okay? Good. So that's it for the presentation. And let's get into the stuff of lecture. So, the name of the lecture is the composition of the intracellular fluid. I already told you that we'll also be talking about the extracellular fluid. So let's first talk about what kinds of fluids we have in the body or how we can divide. It's not really about the fluids, it's rather dividing the spaces that we have in our body. So the intracellular fluid, as the name suggests, is all the fluid, all the water, solution, all the components of that, which are hidden inside cells. So they are bounded by the cell membrane, okay, and whatever is inside is intracellular fluid. Everything that is outside of cells is called extracellular fluid, as you would expect. So the total body fluid is either intracellular or extracellular. But the extracellular fluid is further subdivided into different spaces or different fluids. So in cells, we have intracellular fluid, as you would expect. Now, everything else is extracellular fluid, but this can be divided into, it can be divided several different ways, but we usually divide it into intravascular fluid. Which means, well, can anyone say, well, well, guess what that means? Intravascular? Just literally what it means, intravascular. Inside the vessels, it's inside the vessels, okay? Mostly we mean blood vessels, but we can also put lymph there, okay? So it's all the fluid which is inside vessels, okay? Now somebody said blood, that's almost true. Can somebody guess why it's almost true but not quite true? Yes, the correct way to talk about it is plasma. Why would we say that intravascular fluid is plasma but, 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 but not the whole blood? Yeah, yes, but maybe a slightly better explanation why we Say plasma is intravascular fluid, but not... Because hmm? plasma is the fluid itself, and blood is the fluid that consists of the blood particles. Yes, so the blood particles, w w where would they be in this, in this thing? <coughs> correct, correct. So we have, in the blood, we have plasma, and then we have cells. And of course, all the fluid in the cells is intracellular fluid, right? Okay, so that's why when we talk about intravascular fluid, we mean plasma, that is blood without cells, because cells contain intracellular fluid, right? All right, and then all the rest of the fluid, basically, is the fluid between the blood vessels, but still, I mean, yeah, it's outside of blood vessels, but it's also outside of cells. And this is called the interstitial fluid. interstitial, which basically just means in between, okay? It's all the fluid which is in between. Well, between cells, between cells, okay? Between tissues, well, it's hard to say, but even within a tissue, all the fluid which is between cells, but it's not in blood vessels or lymph vessels, okay, would be the interstitial fluid. Now, what are the, the relative amounts of these fluids? Now, this is not something where I need you to know the exact number, okay? It's not about exact numbers because it's gonna be different between different people and different times of day, etc. 
But just to give you an idea, what is the relative ratio of these, uh, uh, of these fluids? So the intravascular fluid in a 70 kilo man, adult man, okay, the usual standard for whatever reason, <laughs> okay, is about 3.5 liters, okay? So the intravascular fluid is about 3.5 liters, thereabouts. Again, it's going to be different for different people. Smaller people will have less. Now, if you are thinking, well, it should be five liters, right? Why isn't it five liters? Because it's without the blood part. Exactly, it's without the blood cells, okay? So this is just the plasma, okay? About 3.5 liters. Now, the extracellular fluid altogether is about 14 liters. So ECF, extracellular fluid, is about 14 liters. And the intracellular fluid is approximately 28 liters. So you can see that the majority of fluids is inside cells, okay? It's probably not surprising. You would probably think that, right? Because the majority of the, the body is cells, so it's not that surprising. But still, it's good to see the numbers. So about 28 liters of intracellular fluid. Again, this is not about the exact numbers because they will vary between people. But just to give you an idea that, in fact, the, the fluid that we think about, which is the plasma, the actual stuff in the blood vessels, is just a tiny bit of the whole fluid that we have in the body. All right. Now, uh, let's now talk about the composition of these fluids, okay? Because we will see that, especially between the intracellular and extracellular fluids, there are quite big differences. And these differences are the background, are the basis for some functional things in the body, as we'll see in a second. So if we just look at the extracellular fluid, ECF, and the intracellular fluid, we can compare and contrast the, the main components. So what are the main components? And let's talk about some concentrations. And again, that's something you may have seen before, or it's the first time you see it, so let's try to put together. So what are the main components of the intracellular or extracellular fluid? Okay, so the main component of both fluids is, is water, right? It's water, okay? So that's by far the, the, the biggest component. I'm not going to give you the concentration of water because it's approximately the same, okay? It's not exactly the same, but it's approximately the same. All right, so one big component is water. What else do we have in these fluids? Okay, so we have ions or salts, so dissolved salts, okay? And we usually describe them as, as ions, okay? And we, and we will now go through some of the major ions and see if there are any differences between the extracellular and intracellular fluids. So, when we talk about ions, we can divide ions into cations and anions, okay? How do you recognize what is a cation, what is an anion? <laughs> we, yeah, based on charge. Which one is which? So anions are negatively charged and cations are positively charged. All right, so let's start with cations, okay? What do you think are the major cations of intracellular extracellular fluid? So calcium is definitely one of them, but it's not nowhere near the major one. Potassium and sodium, okay? So the main cations of both intracellular and extracellular fluid are potassium and sodium, or sodium with potassium. So let's start with sodium and potassium. Now, it is actually between these two ions that we find the biggest difference between the extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. And one of them is going to be the major cation of one of them, and the other one is going to be the major cation of the other one. Does anyone know how this works? Correct. So sodium is the major, major cation of the extracellular fluid, while potassium is the major cation of the intracellular fluid. Okay? So in the extracellular fluid, give or take, we could find about 140 millimolar sodium. By the way, 
the concentrations in the extracellular fluid are something that we would like you to know, okay? Um, we will just give you the, I will just give you the major ones, okay? Now, at this point, if you just know this one number, it's good enough, okay? Later on, we will actually expect you to know the exact range, the exact normal range, because this, for physicians, this is a very important knowledge, okay? So at this point, if you just have these kind of ballpark figures, it's fine. Later on, we will want you to know the exact ones for the extracellular fluid. For the intracellular fluid, the ballpark numbers are going to be fine um, for a long time because you won't really need them very much. All right, so about 140 millimolar. Now, in side cells, and you will find slightly different numbers, so I'll just give you the approximate one, the one that I have found somewhere, but you can find slightly different ones. It is about 12 millimolar. So you can see that there's a 10 times lower concentration of sodium inside cells as opposed to outside cells. Now with potassium, is the other way around, okay? So we have a lot of potassium inside cells and not that much potassium outside. So does anyone know what the, what the extracellular concentration of potassium is, the blood concentration of potassium is? Ish? Anybody? About four millimolar, that's a good number. Again, later on we will want you to know the exact range, but now approximately four millimolar. While inside the cells, it is about 140. Again, you will find slightly different numbers because of the difference between cells and between people, etc. But approximately this, okay? Please make sure when you learn these numbers, learn the units with them, okay? Every time in different tests or exams, we find people that they remember the number, but they have no idea whether it's millimolar, micromolar, molar, and then they tell us like really, really strange things, okay? So make sure you know the units, because they are mostly millimolar, but for some of them, they might not be millimolar, all right? All right, so those are the major cations of the extracellular intracellular fluid. Then, of course, we also have anions. So does anyone know what the major anion of the intracellular extracellular fluid is? Chlorine. It's not chlorine because the ion is called chloride. Okay, so chlorine is the element, chloride is the anion of chlorine. Okay, so we have chloride. So chloride is the main, at least the small anion in the extracellular intracellular fluid. So extracellularly, that's the number you should be aware, is about 110, let's say, millimolar, 100, 110, thereabouts. While in the intracellular fluid, we have much less chloride. I will give you a number, let's say three millimolar. Again, this will differ. But I can tell you already that in the second year, when we talk about the functioning of the smell organ, those, are, those cells in there are an exception and they have a very high concentration of chlorides in them and that helps them do certain things, okay? In the hearing organ, we will hear about cells that, that, have, actually very high, that have actually very low potassium concentration, which is also interesting, okay? So there are exceptions to it, but approximately these differences hold. All right. The next important anion is bicarbonate or hydrogen carbonate. Okay, why is it so important? We will get to that when we talk about buffers at the end of the lecture. Okay, so I will tell you why it's important, but it's an important component, uh, an, an important anion. And here the concentrations between the extracellular and intracellular fluid are actually relatively similar. Okay. So, I mean, they're not exactly the same, but they're, they're similar, so we get something like 25 and 10. So 25 millimolar, 10 millimolar. So there's some difference, but not, it's not as massive as we, had, as we had before. Uh, the last small anion that I want to talk about is phosphate. Again, very important because it forms buffers, so we'll talk about it later on as part of buffers but it's gonna be phosphate. And I will label phosphate like this. This means, this, just, this abbreviation means inorganic phosphate. Now, can somebody tell me 
why I'm not writing the exact formula of that. Why well, I'm just putting the inorganic phosphate. It's related to buffering. In a lot of different ways. Correct. So phosphate can actually exist in several different forms depending on how many protons it releases. Okay? So we can have phosphoric acid with a, with, which has three protons. If it releases one proton, we get phosphorate. Nope. So phosphoric acid is three protons. We release one, and it's going to be called. Phosphorus is the element. This is? What is, it, what is this? This is phosphoric acid. This is phosphoric acid. Sorry. It's not phosphate, no. It's dihydrogen phosphate. Hydrogen phosphate. <coughs> phosphate. OK? So we have all these different forms of phosphate. And the ratio of these forms depends on the ratio of these different forms depends on what does it mean, hydrogen? On the pH. It depends on the pH. Yeah? So as pH changes, the ratio of these individual forms of phosphate or phosphoric acid will shift. That's why I'm putting all together as inorganic phosphate because we don't know what the ratio is, right? Because it depends on the pH. Does it make sense? Okay. In the body, we will probably never find phosphoric acid because the pH would have to be very, very low to get it. And we will probably not find a lot of phosphate because the pH would have to be very high to get it. Okay? So you, most of the inorganic phosphate is going to be dihydrogen phosphate and hydrogen phosphate. So those are going to be the main ones that we actually find inside cells and in other body fluids. Okay? So for the phosphate in the extracellular fluid, Let's give uh, something like 2 millimolar. So not a massive amount. And for the intracellular fluid, it's a bit more. It's about 30 millimolar. And we will come to this when we talk about buffers, because that also tells you, because we said that these phosphates act as buffers, so the difference in concentrations also tells you where this buffer is going to be important and where it might be less important. Okay? So for phosphate, it's going to be more important inside cells than outside because there is more of it there. Now, we see here a collection of cations and anions. Okay? Now, if you sum them up, if you add them up, if, the, if you add the concentrations both sides of cations and anions, we should get to the same number. Why, why do you think this is important, to get approximately to the same number, or almost exactly to the same number, rather? Again, I'll, I'll say it again, because maybe you didn't quite get it. Okay. So why, if we sum cations and anions on one side, extracellularly, for example, and cations and anions on the inside, intracellularly, why should we get almost exactly the same number? Wait, yeah, you? No, 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 your, your colleague, yeah? You can see that the concentrations are different. But I'm saying that if you sum them up on one side and the other side, you should get the same number. Why? Huh? No, well, could be part of the reason. OK. So it is really about charge, about electroneutrality. The thing with charged, charged species is that even if you have just a slight imbalance in the charges, okay, so if you had more positive charges on one side and less negative charges on the other one or whatever, okay, if you have a difference, 
you get a very large electric field, okay, like really large. Only a few, few diff you know, few atoms of a difference create massive electric fields, okay. Now we'll see that this is actually what happens, okay. So we'll see that we do have some electric fields, but if the difference was substantial, okay, if we were missing a third of anions or something, the electric fields would be so huge that they would just tear us apart, okay. So these two, so the, the balance of positively and negatively charged ions on the inside and the outside have to be very, very, very close to each other, okay? They're not exactly the same, they have to be very close. Otherwise, the electric fields would be just too, too huge, okay? But we will talk about electric fields in a second. Now, yes? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, I, I was going to get to that, but it's, it's a very good question. Okay, so am I talking here about the total extracellular fluid or the interstitial, interstitial or the intravascular? Well, so far, I've been talking about both of them. Okay, so both the interstitial fluid and the intravascular fluid, because so far, they are actually very similar. Okay, there are very few, there are slight differences, but not massive differences. But here we are coming to the last component, and there, there will be a difference between them. Because the last big component that I want to talk about are proteins. Why do I put proteins among these charged species? Well, because proteins are charged, right? Proteins generally have charges on them. How come? Why do proteins have charges on them? Yes? I do understand your answer. So you're saying that uh, an amino acid is a Twitter, Twitter ion, so it can actually have both charges. That's true. But once you put it in a protein, it loses this ability, OK? Because you bind both the amino group and the carboxy group. So the reason is somewhere else. Why are, why are proteins charged? Maybe because of the bond between them? Not really. It's not because of the bond. Because of the rest of the amino acids, some of them Because the? Okay, and when you say the rest, you mean the... Okay, so the side chains of amino acids, some of them carry charged groups. Yeah, some of them can be positively charged, some of them can be negatively charged. And that's the reason why proteins overall have a charge. Okay, generally they have a charge. Now, most proteins overall have negative charge. Okay, there are some proteins which can be positively charged, okay, but mostly proteins are negatively charged. So we take them to be anions, overall anions. Okay, and the reason why I was talking about this electron neutrality that you have to have like the same amount of anions and cations on both sides, that's actually if you sum them up, you would see that we're still missing some anions. Okay, we're still, it, it wouldn't work really. So with the proteins, we fill it in. There are many more proteins inside cells. It's some number, okay? Again, it will differ, okay? Then they are outside. But here, it's important to realize that there's a difference between interstitial fluid and intravascular fluid. Because intravascularly, we have many more proteins. I will explain again, okay? So here, there's a difference between intravascular fluid and interstitial fluid. So I'll say that again. The last big component, charged component, of, of both extracellular and intracellular fluid are proteins. Inside cells, there are quite a lot of proteins. So they're actually, they're actually making up for, the, for example, the missing chloride ions. Okay? There are far fewer chloride anions inside cells. But we have many more proteins, which are also negatively charged. So this balances things out. Does this make sense, what I just said? Yeah, we have a lot of proteins. They are negatively charged. So we don't need to have that many chlorides inside, because we have these proteins there. Yeah? Good. Now, in the intravascular fluid, in the plasma, there is actually a pretty high concentration of proteins. Okay. But in the interstitial fluid, that's the fluid which is just, you know, bathing around cells outside of blood vessels, the concentration of proteins is very low. So this is the only major difference between the intravascular fluid and the interstitial fluid, is the amount of proteins. And this will become super important 
when in the second year we start talking about microcirculation, okay, so how blood moves in tissues and how it exchanges things, exchanges things and this difference in protein concentration between the intravascular and, extravas and, and interstitial fluid is super important because if we didn't have that difference, all the water from the blood vessels would be leaving the blood vessels and we would start swelling, 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 or all the, all the fluid would just end up in the tissues, okay? So we need this difference in protein concentration because it basically, it's kind of a preview, it basically sucks the water back into blood vessels. Yes? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So the proteins which are in the intervascular fluid, they cannot cross into the interstitial fluid, and that's why we have a different, different concentration there, okay? And this is also the background of so-called oncotic pressure. Oncotic pressure, we will talk about it in a second when we talk about osmotic pressure. So here we get oncotic pressure difference. We'll get to that, don't worry, if, if, you, if, if it's a bit mysterious. All right. Any questions about this basic composition? Now, there are many, many more components, okay? There's magnesium, there's calcium, there are small molecules, glucose, urea, creatine, whatever. There are loads of them, and we will talk about all of them, okay? But so far, I just want you to get this, this um, basic idea about differences in charged species concentrations between those two fluids, okay? So we will get to all the other components later on, but here, let's just get this, this basic difference. Any questions about this? Good. So, what do these differences in composition mean for some functional properties of cells? Well, there are, main two, there are two main phenomena which rely on this. One is membrane potential and the formation of membrane potential, and the other one is osmosis. So let's start with the membrane potential. Now, you, you've heard before that some of our cells, actually many of our cells, have a voltage difference, an electric potential difference, on their membranes. And this is quite important for the function of certain cells. For example, which cells Nerve require it? Hmm? Nerve, cells. Nerve cells, neurons, absolutely. Muscle cells, absolutely. Cardiomyocytes, yeah, so, so cardiac muscle, absolutely. Okay, so those are probably the big ones, but many other cells also have some potentials and they are quite important for the function. How do these membrane potentials actually come about? How do they form? Yes? Okay, so if I, I see what you're saying. So you're saying, well, it's because of the, the difference in the, the number of positive ions. But if you actually summed this up and added all the ones that I didn't mention, you would get almost exactly the same. So you, you, you're right. But it's not just kind of this, okay, that we would be starting with different concentrations, okay? Yeah, yeah? It is. It is due to diffusion of ions out of the cell or into the cell, and this is caused by specific permeability of the membrane for some ions and impermeability for other ions. And I will now give you the simplest model, okay? The reality is always more complicated, but I will give you the simplest model where you can see how a membrane potential is set up a resting membrane potential. So a membrane potential when the cell is not doing anything, okay, it will reach some membrane potential, and I will show you how you can imagine you can, a, a simplified model of how this works. So we have a cell, okay, we, and we have extracellular fluid, and let's say that in the beginning, we only have these differences in concentrations, but the sum of all the positive negative ions, as I said, is the same on both sides. Okay, so there's no membrane potential. Okay, we have exactly the same number of positively charged inside and outside, and the same number of negatively charged inside and outside. Okay, N no, no membrane potential. But we do have these differences in concentrations. Does this make sense? 
So we have different, so for specific ions, we have different concentrations, but if you sum them up, the positive and negative charges cancel out. Okay? Good. Now, imagine that in the cell membrane, we make a hole which will only allow potassium ions to pass through. Now, you know that biological membranes, lipid membranes, are generally impermeable to ions, right? Ions will not go through it for whatever reasons, but that's how it is, okay? So, so the ions cannot cross the membrane unless we make a hole there. Now, when I say we make a hole, usually it is an ion channel. It's a protein molecule which allows the ions to go in and out, okay? But let's just assume that it's a hole, okay? But it's a hole that only allows potassium to move in or out. No other ions can cross. What will happen? Why does potassium move out? Okay, so there is a concentration gradient. Okay, there's a higher concentration of potassium inside than it is outside. So overall, potassium will be moving outside of the cell. Now, when I say overall, this is quite crucial because the potassium ions, they have no idea about any potential or concentration or anything like that. They are just randomly moving around, okay? But since we have many more potassium ions inside than they are outside, this random movement of potassium in, out, etc., will overall, it's more probable overall, that a potassium ion will go out than a potassium ion going in. I'll say that again. Just by random movement, it is more probable that a potassium ion will go from a place where there are more potassium ions to a place where there are fewer potassium ions than the other way around, just by random movement, okay? We could talk about entropy and thermodynamics, which we will, okay, in the next course. But at this point, just imagine that it's a random movement and it's more likely for the potassium ion to end up out, to end up going out than going in, okay? The potassium ion itself knows nothing about the situation, okay? Are you with me? Good. So overall, potassium ions will be moving out. Now, when will this stop? Okay, so one possible answer is that it will stop when the gradient disappears. That means when the concentration outside and inside is the same. Okay, so yeah, that's a possible answer. It is not the correct answer though, and I will tell you why. As the potassium ions are moving out of the cell, they are taking positive charge with them, which means that the cell inside becomes more and more negatively charged, and the outside of the cell is becoming more and more positively charged. Yeah? So this means that just simply making a hole in the membrane for permeable for one cation, specifically potassium, which will, based on the uh, concentration gradient, will start moving out, it will start creating a membrane potential, an electric potential between the inside and the outside. Now, this electric potential, this difference, this potential difference between the inside and the outside will keep increasing as the potassium moves out. And at some point, the electric field, which is created by this potential, will be so high that it will start pulling the potassium ions back in because they are positively charged and the inside of the cell is negatively charged. So this electric field will start basically pulling on the, on the potassium ions to go back. Yeah? Now at some point, this outward push, it's not really push, but the outward push of the concentration gradient will equal the inside, the inward push of the electric field, and the movement of potassium ions will stop. So in fact, the movement of potassium ions will stop way, way, way before the concentration would equal. Okay? It will stop, and in our cells, it will stop at a membrane potential 
I'll call it delta psi, okay, the membrane potential of approximately 90 millivolts, or rather minus 90 millivolts. So when the potential difference, this minus means that it's measured from the inside out. That's a convention, okay? So when the inside becomes so negative that it's minus 90 millivolts, at this point, the movement of potassium will stop. And we get a resting potential of 90 millivolts. This is how a resting potential in a cell is created. So most of our cells, in their resting state, when they are not excited on anything, are permeable. They have membranes permeable just for potassium. Potassium flows out, and once it, <coughs> once it reaches 90 millivolts, it stops. Now, there's a question. Just, you have to shout. So it's, it's measured like inside relative to outside. Okay, that's why it's minus 90. And it's a convention that we always measure it like from the, out, from the inside out. Okay. Now, yep. Yes, yes, as you say. So basically, they keep moving, the potassium ions keep moving in and out, but overall, the net movement stops. So it's exactly, so the number of ions moving in will be the same as the, the number of ions moving out, okay? So the, the net movement stops, but the actual movement of ions doesn't stop, obviously, okay? They still go in and out, okay? But those two movements will equal, so the overall flux of potassium ions will stop. Now, once you start learning about individual membrane potentials in our body, you will see that actually very few cells reach this very high resting potential of minus 90. Okay? It's not a common resting potential. And the reason for that is that many of our cells actually have other ions open, not just the potassium ions. They, can may, they may have chloride ions or calcium ions open, and that's why the potential, the, the resting potential, is going to be usually much lower than or higher, depending on where you look at it. It could be minus 70 millivolts or something like that, less negative. So this is our limit. We can't really get over minus 90, okay? But many cells will have less negative membrane potentials because there are other ions playing a role. So what I gave you is a very simplified model, which explains, let's say, 80% of what goes on in membrane potential. Then we get a lot of details which kind of tweak the actual resting potentials in different cells. Yeah? Just to make sure, the 90 millivolt is the difference between the outside and the inside? Yes. And which one is going to be, and the intracellular are going to be more positive? The intracellular is going to be more negative because you're moving potassium out. You're moving positive charges out, so the inside is going to be more negative. So in general, we can say that the inside is more negative? Yes. In, in our cells, yes. If they have membrane potential, the, the inside is negative because they have this, this potassium permeability. And membrane potential, the definition is that we have a difference of ions and... Yeah. Of charges. Okay? It's an electric potential, or rather, more specifically, <coughs> potential difference. Okay? It's a difference between potentials of charged molecules, of charged species. Now, we'll take a short break, but before, but before the short break, let me just give you a little preview. Because this is, a, this is resting potential, so the cell is not excited. Okay? Now, what happens if we excite it? I will, very, I will simplify it massively, but we will talk about it in the third course in more detail. Now imagine that you poke another hole in there, but this time the hole will allow sodium channels to move. What will happen? So sodium will start moving in, okay? And what will happen to the potential? And the potential will become more positive. And this is the basis for action potential. Okay, action potential is a change in potential. It's a depolarization. Depolarization meaning you change the polarity, you change the, the, um, the, the size of the potential, okay? And you change it by opening another hole for different ions, okay? And then all sorts of other things, repolarizations, etc., happen, and we will talk about it in the third course. Um, but this is the basis for membrane potential. All right, let's take a four-minute break. Four minutes. 
Okay, just a really, really short break, and we will continue with the, with the rest of the lecture. So, during the break, I had one question posed to me, which is quite important. And that is, what is the role of the ATP, of the potass sodium potassium, what is the role of the sodium potassium ATPase, the pump, okay, which pumps out sodium and pumps in potassium? Generally speaking, the role of this ATPase is to restore the concentrations of ions after an action potential. So after we depolarize the cell, we allow sodium to go in. The ATP, these ATPase, this, this pump, basically restores the concentrations of ions. Okay, so. The ATPase itself is not responsible for achieving a resting potential or anything like that. Okay, it's there to give the con to, to put the concentrations of ions back to normal, back to where they were before the depolarization occurred. Okay, so it doesn't really play an important role in this. It plays a role in restoring things, and with that, I will say that during during an action potential, and we haven't really spoken about it very much, so I will say it again in the third year. But during an action potential, the number of ions that actually moves into, into the cell and has to be removed is tiny, okay? So if you measure the concentration of sodium and potassium before an action potential and after the action potential, you couldn't actually measure a difference because it's, it's only about 10,000 ions per cell that actually move out or in. It's a tiny, tiny amount which causes big changes in potential, but it's with respect to concentrations, it's almost nothing. The concentrations basically, basically don't change, okay? I mean, they may change very close to the membrane, but inside of the whole cell, the concentrations just remain the same, okay? There's, it's, a, it's a very, very small change. Sorry, I didn't catch the beginning, but you're asking if the ATPA is, uh, creates the, the potential. No, as I said, it doesn't, it doesn't. Okay, it's there to restore the concentrations of ions after the action potential happened. Okay? I know it is electrogenic, it causes some small change in, in electric potential, but the resting potential is created mainly by this potassium conductance. Okay? The NAK ATPase plays a very, very tiny role, negligible role. Okay? Good. Any questions about the action potential? Oh, sorry, the resting potential. We haven't really done that? No. Good. Let's move on to the next phenomenon, which is very closely related, and that's osmosis. What is osmosis? Anybody? <coughs> okay, a mov movement of water from a higher potential to lower potential, whatever that means, yeah? Yes, so osmosis is a phenomenon when a solvent, and since we are talking about human body, the solvent is water, so we're talking about water. It doesn't have to be water. It can be any kind of solvent, okay? But basically it means a movement of molecules of solvent through a semi-permeable membrane. And when I say semi-permeable membrane, in this case, it is a membrane which is only permeable to the molecules of the solvent, of water. I'll say that again. So here we had in the resting state, we had only, the membrane was only permeable for one thing and that was potassium, okay? Now imagine that the membrane is permeable to only one thing and that's water, okay? And this is actually the case for our cells. So almost all our cells are, relative, are almost completely freely permeable to water. Okay, so water can flow in and out without some major problems because there are some aquaporins, there are some channels that allow that. Okay, so water can flow in and out quite easily. So let's now forget about ions. Let's now forget about permeability for ions. Let's just, let's just imagine that the membrane of the cell is only permeable to water. Okay, now water will move from basically similar to any other ion will move from a place where there is a lot of water 
to a place where there is not so much water. In other words, it will move from a place where there's a higher concentration of water to a place where there's lower concentration of water. So it's basically exactly the same thing. It's just a diffusion. It's just diffusion, nothing else. Only in this case, the diffusion only is relevant to the molecules of the solvent, not the solutes. The solutes cannot go through, so they're not doing anything, okay? But the water is going to be moving from its higher concentration to its lower concentration. This is clear, right? There is a concentration gradient of water, and water will move from its higher concentration to its lower concentration. Are we still together? Now, the trouble with osmosis is that usually you hear it the other way around. You hear it that water will be moving from a less concentrated solution to a more concentrated solution. Which can be confusing because you would say, why? You know, the concentration gradient, what? It's the other way around. Well, the trouble is, you, I mean, you have to look at it from the point of view of water. Because in a more concentrated solution, the concentration of water is lower, right? If, it, if we have a more concentrated solution of sodium chloride and less concentrated solution of sodium chloride, that means that in the more concentrated solution of sodium chloride, there is less water. The concentration of water is lower, right? In the less concentrated solution of sodium chloride, the concentration of water is higher. Again? Yeah? So imagine that you have a one molar concentration of sodium chloride, okay, and you have one millimolar concentration of sodium chloride. Okay? So this is a more concentrated solution of sodium chloride, and this is less concentrated solution of sodium chloride. That's obvious, right? If you look at it from the point of view of water, there is actually more water here and less water here. Yeah? So water, if you put a semi-permeable membrane between them, which way is it going to be moving? Is it going to be moving up or down? So who thinks it's going to be moving up? Raise your hand. Water. water. And it, who thinks it's going to be moving down? Raise your hand. OK, there are a few people who think that. OK, it's going to be moving up because there are many more molecules of water in this less concentrated solution. Right? Because the concentration of water is higher here. So osmosis really is just a simple diffusion of one, of one substance, in this case water, which is absolutely normally moving across its own concentration gradient. Okay? And it will be moving from a place where there's more water to a place where there's less water. That means, when we look at it from the other side, it will be moving from a less concentrated solution to a more concentrated solution. Okay? Good. That's all there is to osmosis, really. Okay? You may have heard, or you will hear, or, yeah, or either way, that we can calculate osmotic pressure or a difference between, so basically, <clears throat> I'll put it in, I'll explain it in a different way. <clears throat> so imagine that you have you have a beaker or whatever, okay, and you have two solutions. One is one has a higher concentration of water, okay, so it's a lower concentration of the solute uh, of the of the solute, yeah, and the water will be moving to the other side, okay, because dif because of diffusion, right? So what will happen with the amount of fluid? So this is where we started. What will happen to the amount of fluid in this, sp in this half and this half? So this one is going to be going up, right? And this one is going to be going down because water is moving here, right? So basically, when this whole thing stops, we will get some difference in the, in the heights of the fluid, okay? And if we just take the hydrostatic pressure which is exerted by the higher, by, the, by where there's a higher 
level of, of the fluid, this gives us the osmotic pressure between them. Okay? Because basically you can think that this is pushing all this fluid up, okay? and this pressure has to be equal to the osmotic pressure. The hydrostatic pressure is going to be equal to the osmotic pressure. Okay? We can calculate that. And the osmotic pressure, which is usually labeled with capital pi, okay, it's a, it's a capital pi, but whatever, um, is equal to some constant called Boltzmann constant. It's not super important that you know that. Capital T is usually temperature, temperature, and C is concentration, okay? Concentration of the solute, not of water, of the solute. Uh, so, yeah, of the solutes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. It's osmotic pressure. Okay. It's capital pi. Now, for those of you who have done some basic chemistry or some physics before, you may have seen this formula. What is this formula? It's the ideal, ideal gas, okay, ideal gas formula, okay? Now, if you take the volume, you divide it by volume, you would get P equals N over V RT. And N over V is concentration. Okay, and then you have to just change the, 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 uh, the constant, okay, F because we have concent different concentrations and different pressures here, okay. But this is actually how they got this formula, okay, so it is, it is actually derived from, from, the, um, from the ideal gas formula, okay, even though it, it, does with, with deals with com something completely different. This is not super crucial that you remember that. Okay, it is just to give you an idea how we can calculate osmotic pressure uh, in a solution compared to pure solvent, just to, make, just to make it clear. Okay, so it's going to be pressure of a solution compared to just pure solvent. Good. Now, last thing about osmosis, which is quite important. So, the thing that is moving is the solvent, water. Now, what are these solutes that we look at the concentration of? Wh which things can cause osmosis? Okay, which particles will make the water move in the in the right direction? The important thing is any particles, any dissolved particles. They don't have to be charged. They don't have to be small. They don't have to be what any particle which is dissolved is going to be a particle which causes osmotic pressure. I'll say it again. Any particle which is dissolved in the solution is a cause for the movement of the, of the solvent. Okay? So many people think, oh, it has to be an ion, it has to be charged. No, it doesn't. Okay? It can be glucose, it can be sodium, it can be proteins, it can be lipids. It, anything that is dissolved will cause osmotic pressure. So, when we are looking at this concentration to calculate the osmotic pressure, we just take all the concentrations of all the particles in the, um, in the solution. Okay? I'll say it again. The concentration of particles causing, or you know, substances or whatever, atoms, molecules, etc., causing the osmotic pressure, is all the particles that are dissolved, and you just take all their concentrations together. Be aware that if you have sodium chloride, what happens to sodium chloride in aqueous solution? It will dissociate into sodium ions and chloride ions. Therefore, you have twice as many particles. So if something dissociates and creates two particles or three particles, you have to multiply the concentration by the number of particles because each particle each individual particle will cause this osmotic phenomenon. So if you are calculating the number of osmotically active particles, you have to be aware, you have to know if the compound or the compounds dissociate or not. 
even if they don't dissociate, they will still cause osmotic pressure, okay? But then you don't have to multiply them. If they do dissociate, you have to multiply them by two, by three, or however many particles they create. Because each individual particle will cause osmotic pressure. What about hydrophobic substances? Yeah, so the question is, what about hydrophobic substances? Well, that depends whether they are dissolved or they are not. So if they just form a little clump, if they form a ball at, and don't really interact with the, with the rest of the solution, they will not really affect the osmotic pressure, or not very much. They will act as one particle, not as a billion particles, because they're not dissolved. But if they are dissolved, even though they're hydrophobic, then they will be osmotically active. Okay? So it's just about whether they are dissolved, because really what we're talking about is the concentration of water. That's the only thing we're really interested in. Okay? So whatever is dissolved is going to decrease the concentration of water. Any questions about osmosis? In medicine, this is a very important thing. It may not sound like it, but there are situations where osmosis and osmotic imbalance can actually kill a person or kill a patient. You may have heard about water poisoning. Who's heard of water poisoning? Just raise your hands if you've heard of it. Okay, many people have, okay? So basically it is poison, it's not really poisoning, right? But if somebody drinks a lot of pure water, what happens is that you get a osmotic imbalance. You basically dilute the blood too much and too quickly. And the cells, especially in the brain, will start sucking in this water because there is lower concentration of water in the brain, and the brain will start swelling. And since the brain doesn't have a lot of space where to swell, okay, it will start pushing through the only holes that are available to it, which is mainly into the spinal canal. And that kills the person very quickly. And this water poisoning, unfortunately, can also happen in a hospital when a physician gives the patient fluids too quickly or rather dilute fluids too quickly. And this, in dehydrated patient, it can happen that they, they can cause brain edema and can kill the patient. So we're talking about these abstract things and particles moving, but actually they have very real impacts on real people. Yes? In cholera. <clears throat> so in cholera, yes, because cholera is causing severe dehydration. So you have to be careful with the fluids, especially if it's been going on for, for a bit. But it doesn't have to be cholera. It actually can be diabetes, for example. So diabetic patients can be very dehydrated when they're not treated properly. And there, it's, so it's, it's a bit more common than cholera. You don't really see a lot of cholera uh, in most developed countries. But yeah, it can be cholera. Yeah. Good. The last bit I want to talk about is pH and buffers. pH is something that we've covered in the prep course, you've covered it in the high schools or whatever you studied before. So, uh, so the idea of pH should not be new. So what is, what is pH? Power of hydrogen. Power of hydrogen, power of hydrogen yeah. Second. Okay, or hydronium ions, that's fine. Pa but what does it mean, power of hydronium ions? That sounds like, you know, a superhero movie or something. Huh? So we use a log logarithmic scale, absolutely. But what is it? What is, what is pH, really? Yeah, it's, it's just a concentration of protons or hydronium ions or whatever, okay? So it's just a concentration of protons. Why are we interested in measuring the concentration of protons? Why is it interesting in any way? To know the acidity of solutions, and why do we need to know the acidity of solutions? Why is it why is it interesting? Yes, because these hydrogen ions, these protons or hydronium ions, influence a lot of stuff. They influence the structure of proteins. They influence the speed of reactions. They play a <clears throat> they they influence a lot of things in our body, in test tubes, when you're doing experiments. So pH is just a concentration of hydronium or, you know, of, of protons, but it is super important. It's more important than sodium, for example, because its effect on all sorts of things is bigger, okay? But it's just a concentration. Now, we use a logarithmic scale, that's true. Why do we use logarithmic scale? <clears throat> 
to make the numbers more readable, because the, the range of possible pHs is so huge, okay, it's let's say 14 orders of magnitude, that you would be dealing with 1 to 10 to the power of 14, okay? It's, it's just, it's very difficult to look at that. So we use a logarithmic scale just to make it look better, okay? But the logarithm is not doing anything with it, okay? We're just transforming the numbers into something that's easier to read. That's all there is to it, okay? So I know that sometimes logarithms can be mystifying, but it's just a transformation just to make it easier to work with. Right, so pH is measuring the acidity of solutions. Now, the acidity of solutions can be influenced by adding acids or bases. What are acids and what are bases? Yeah. Okay, so according to the Bronsted theory, Bronsted lower, lower theory, and that's the one that we're gonna be mostly using, is basically says that an acid is a compound that can donate a proton, okay? And a base is a compound which can accept a proton, okay? That's all there is. There are different theories of acids which are used in organic chemistry for other reasons, but this is a very simple one. That's the one we're going to use. So we have compounds that can dissociate, that can give off a proton, they're called acids, and we have, we have compounds that can accept the, uh, the proton. Now, imagine that you have a a compound, a base, so it's something that can accept the proton. Once it accepts a proton, it changes into? Yeah, it changes into an acid, right? Because now it is a compound that can give the proton back, okay? And vice versa. If we have an acid, it releases a proton, it becomes a base because it can accept the proton back, right? So it's a reversible thing and basically, being an acid or being a, uh, a base is, is kind of a relative thing. It depends what you are in and how you're exchanging things oh, with the surroundings. Even with the strong acids? Yeah, even with the strong acids, because even a very strong acid can take the proton back if, for example, there is an even stronger acid in the solution. I'll say it again. If you have a strong acid in, in just water, it will probably dissociate, let's say, to 100%, not quite, but to a very large percentage. But if you add a stronger acid, the stronger acid will probably push the protons back into the, the acid, okay? Or it will make it more likely that the old strong acid will accept the proton, okay? So it's a relative thing, okay? If you have a stronger acid, it will start actually pushing the protons or it will change the equilibrium so that it actually moves uh, and the old strong acid can accept the protons. Now, um, you've seen before how to calculate the pH of a solution of an acid. How does it work? So first you have to make sure, first, first you have to know whether it's a strong acid which is the one where we assume that it's going to be completely dissociated, or if it is a weak acid where it is not going to be completely dissociated, okay? Now, these are just kind of assumptions, okay? We just assume that it's gonna be completely dissociated or not completely dissociated, even though it can actually be somewhere in between, okay? So for those acids which are kind of in between, these assumptions might not be exactly right and you might not actually get a, a good calculation, okay? Because there, there may be issues. But anyway, how does it work for a strong acid or strong base? Yeah? Uh, minus, uh, log to the right. So we basically just take the concentration of the acid that we put in the solution. And since we assume that it's all, that it's gonna be completely dissociated, the concentration of protons is going to be equal to the concentration of the acid. Now, depending on how many protons the acid can release, right? If it can release two protons, it's gonna be twice the concentration. If it can release three protons, it's gonna be three times the concentration. I'm just checking that we're on the same page, yeah? So we take the concentration of the acid, we multiply it by the number of protons that it can release as a strong acid. Usually it's just one, but it can be, in theory, can be more than that, okay? For sulfuric acid, for example, yeah, we'll release both of them. So we just multiply it, and that gives us our concentration of protons, and we just take the minus log of that. So. Okay. 
whatever. Okay. So the pH of a strong acid is we take the concentration of the acid because we assume that it's going to be completely, uh, completely dissociated. Actually, I will just put in C as a concentration. That's better. It's the analytic concentration. So we put in this much. It got completely dissociated. We multiplied by the number of protons which are released. Yeah? And we take a negative logarithm of that. That's it. How is it with weak acids? So let's, let's try to figure it out from what is actually going on and how, how we do that. So first of all, we start with the dissociation constant. What is a dissociation constant? Does anyone know? So it is an equilibrium constant, and we will talk about equilibrium later on. It's an equilibrium constant for the reaction of dissociation. Okay, That's all it is. It's an equilibrium constant for dissociation of an acid. So let's, have, let's assume that we have a reaction where an acid reacts with water. And we get. H3O plus, plus A minus. Yeah, very simple dissociation. It moves back and forwards, and it reaches an equilibrium at a certain point. Are you still with me? We have 10 minutes left. Good. OK, so we can write an equilibrium constant for this reaction, because it reaches an equilibrium. At a certain point, the, the concentrations of uh, reactants and products is, are not going to be changing anymore it's the, at equilibrium. And at this equilibrium, we can say that the products, so H3O plus times A minus divided by HA times water is going to give us the dissociation constant. OK? Now, usually, we get rid of this concentration of water because we just assume it's going to be the same everywhere. Okay? And then we change this dissociation constant to this Ka, which is the dissociation constant for the, for the it's, it's a slightly different, it's a modified equilibrium constant. Now, what are the assumptions for the weak acid? So first assumption is, which is kind of logical, and that is that the, the concentration of H3O plus is going to be equal to the concentration of A minus. That these two, so these first, what, when we think about it, so we're talking about a weak acid. Okay? Now, if there is any dissociation at all, it will create both a proton, H3O plus, and the anion A minus. So these two concentrations have to be the same. So let, let me just, let's go step by step. So this is going to be equal H3O plus squared. Yeah, because this is the same as this. So it's just like multiplying the same thing twice, yeah, together. Just nod your head if you, if you understand where, what I'm doing now. These two have to be the same, right? For every proton, we should get one A minus. There's no other way around it. So these are going to be the same, OK? Yes. Say again? Yes, of course. Yeah. If, if the reaction was that there are two protons being released, then we are going to put this squared, etc. Okay? So, so we just add them together. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is possible to work with that. Okay? I'm just assuming that there's just one proton being released. Right. And we have this concentration of the acid. Now, here is the trick. This concentration, when it's in square brackets, it means that it is the equilibrium concentration. Once the reaction reaches equilibrium, this is the concentration of the acid at equilibrium. 
Now, we have no way of knowing that. We don't know what the concentration of the acid is going to be at equilibrium. Okay? So what we do is we say, well, it's a weak acid. Therefore, it's going to be the same as the concentration that we put in. Because only very, very, very small proportion of it is actually going to dissociate. So we say, well, basically, it's just what we put in. Okay? I'm trying to show you that it is an approximation. Okay? It's a pretty, pretty good approximation, but it's not exactly the right amount. But it will give us almost the right pH. Okay? So we say that this is going to be equal to C, the actual concentration that we put in. Right? And then you just multiply things around, okay, and you, you get the expression with the square root, okay? You've seen that before, I'm sure. I wonder if I have it here. So that, yeah. So the pH is going to be equal to one half pKa divided by, sorry, minus one half log. If you can't see how I got from here to here, do it as an exercise at home. And I think you also have it in the workbooks. So if you look at the workbooks, you can work this, this example out. Okay. It is quite good to understand how you get there. The trick, the important trick, which is not exactly right, but it's good enough, is that we say the equilibrium constant of the weak acid, sorry, the equilibrium concentration of the weak acid is going to be equal to the acid that we added in. It's not true, right? Some, some of the acid has to dissociate, otherwise we wouldn't have any pH change, right? So it is not true, but it's almost true, because if, if only one in a thousand of the molecules of the acid dissociates, we can say, okay, basically none of it dissociated. And that's why we can calculate it. Otherwise, it would be much, 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 much more complicated to work with it. Do we understand how this works? No? If not, in your workbooks, you can actually go through the, the derivation. I think it's quite useful to, to see that. Yes? Why is it H3O two times? Because this has to be equal to this. For each proton that you release, you have to release one anion from the. So the one, one molecule of acid will divide into a proton and an anion. So the concentration of the two has, to, has always got to be the same. Right? Yes. If HCl dissociates, there is one proton, one H3O+, and one chloride. And they have to be the same concentration. I mean, here we are talking about weak acids, but it's, it's going to be the same for a strong acid as well. There's got to be the same concentration of protons as, chlori as chloride ions. Where would they come, you know, they have to be the same, right? Good. The final bit is about buffers. What are buffers? What are they? It's what? That there is a change in pH. Resist, resist. resist. OK. They resist the, OK. Basically, they are just a mixture of a weak acid and its anion, or a weak base and its anion. So we get a mixture of HA plus A minus, OK? Or B and BH plus, OK? Either way. How do they work? So you have a mixture of these two forms. Let's talk about the acid. That's probably easier to imagine. We have a mixture of these two forms of the acid. One can release a proton. That's the HA. That's the acid. And the other one can accept a proton. Remember, we said in the beginning, if an acid releases a proton, it becomes a base, and it can accept a proton. So we basically just mix those two together. We have a, a, an undissociated acid, and we have a dissociated acid. 
And this mixture then allows or makes it possible that when we add a proton, the salt will take it up, will bind it, and will be become an acid. When we take a proton away, the acid will release a proton, and therefore the concentration of protons is not going to change. I'll say it again. If we add from somewhere else a proton, this part of the buffer will bind the proton, will become HA, and the concentration of protons, pH, is not going to change because this proton was consumed by the buffer. If, on the other hand, we try to take away a proton in the presence of the buffer, this HA will release a proton, will turn to A minus, and the pH is not going to change because the proton was kind of replenished, okay? It was put back by the acid. This is how, how buffers work. That's all there is to it, okay? Now, it is the, the function of the buffer and also the pH will differ depending on the ratio of these two, okay? On the concentrations. And there is the henderson hasselbach equation which tells you what the resulting pH is going to be. I'm not going to go into details about henderson hasselbach because you have it in your workbooks and it's everywhere, okay? So it's, it's, I'm, I'm not going to spend time with that, okay? But that basically just tells you how to mix those two components together in order to get a specific pH. What is important to know is that the buffer is going to be most effective best at buffering at around pH, which is equal to pKa. So if you make a buffer from whatever acid, from whatever anion, which has some kind of pKa, okay, so that's something you, you can find out in the tables, your, this buffer is going to be most effective around the pH, which is going to be equal to this pKa. Why is that? Exactly. So when you look at the henderson hasselbach equation, you'll find out that when the pH is equal to pKa, you will have equal amount of HA and A minus. So you will have exactly equal amounts of that, which means that it can accept the biggest number of protons and it can release the biggest number of protons. So that's why the buffer is best is going to be performing best at around its pKa. The final bit is physiological buffers. The most important buffer in the extracellular fluid, it's not the most abundant, but most important is bicarbonate. It's not the most abundant buffer, okay? No, no, no. The most abundant buffer in the extracellular fluid are actually proteins. In the blood, we have a lot of proteins and they're actually very good buffers. Why is bicarbonate buffer so important? No. The, the reason why bicarbonate buffer, which is composed of bicarbonate and carbon dioxide, so this is the acid, this is the, the salt, okay, is that we can easily change the concentration of carbon dioxide by breathing, okay? So if we need to change the, the ratio of the two bits, of the two parts of the buffer, we can just start breathing more, okay? And drop the concentration of carbon dioxide and we shift the, the pH of the buffer. So that's why physiologically bicarbonate is super important because we can easily, very quickly, change the concentration. It's not the most abundant buffer. As I said, most abundant buffers are proteins, okay? But this is a super good buffer because we can easily kind of move it around. Intracellularly, bicarbonate is not so important. Intracellularly, the most important are proteins, as I said, but also phosphates. So intracellularly, the most important buffers are proteins and phosphates. Phosphates because we have hydrogen phosphate and dihydrogen phosphate, and they can accept and give protons okay, and, f and work as a buffer. The final buffer I'll tell you about is mostly in urine, is, is, is important in urine, and that is ammonia buffer, okay? So ammonium, ammonia,
is another important buffer. Okay, and those are the physiologically important buffers, and we will talk about them many, many more times when we talk about acid-base balance and how they influence these things, but this was the basic theory for today. Any questions? Use your workbooks. There is a lot of information there. There are some problems that can help you understand how to do these things. We went through them relatively quickly, okay? Use the time, use the workbooks to, to give you a better idea and practice how to work with these things, okay? Huh? I don't know. You have to find it. All right. Okay. That's it.